Welcome to tonight's candidate meeting for the Whangarei electorate, uh, hosted by the Northern Advocate, the HITS, and the Northland Chamber of Commerce. We will start off this evening as per your programs, which I hope you've all got one of those, with a three-minute opening address from the candidates. There will be some questions from the Chamber of Commerce CEO, Tony Collins. There will be some questions from me, from advocate readers and the HITS listeners. And the candidates get an opportunity at the end to leave you with some parting words, 120 seconds of wisdom before you exit the building. In terms of exiting the building, you should all have one of these and we would encourage you to, uh, to vote. It's a non-scientific poll. And depending on the numbers that we get, we may or may not proceed with publishing it. I think we would be looking for a couple of hundred votes at least, and that looks like maximum numbers tonight, so I would encourage you all to vote, um, as we are encouraging you all to vote on September 23rd. My co-host this evening hiding behind me, which is most unlike her, is Charmaine Soljak. Come just forward, short. please, Soljak. I'm just short, that's Thank all. You. Kia ora everyone, I'm Charmaine Soljak. Lovely to meet you all. Nice to see you out on such an important occasion. I think any time you get the chance to be informed about anything, there's a lot more power in your decisions and your choice making. Um, we've got a, like a, the, the candidates that we've got here, we're going to introduce them to you now and um, I want you to give them a warm welcome as they come up. Who's so our first candidate? Our first candidate we? is Ash Holwell. You'll know Ash uh, from last year. He was here for the mayoral uh, debates as well. Ash Holwell's for uh, representing the Green Party. It's lovely to have you here. Ash, got this. Come on up, Ash. Come on up, uh, Ash. Nice to have you here this evening. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Thank Great. you all for coming up. Now, you have been here before as a local government candidate. Totally, yep. Um, is there much difference between Ash Holwell, local government campaigner, and central government campaigner? Well, last year I was asking people to vote for me, and this year I'm asking people to vote for the Green Party. So, yes, completely different. Fantastic. Yep. And you've got your name on the election signs this year, we see. Yeah, yeah, that's a first for the Greens. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we've made sure that we're all citizens, so we're doing very well with that as well. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Over to you, Ash. Away you go. O tēnā koe whānau, ko pareha ke te maunga, ko hātē te awa, ko pehi awari, tahi tahi ono, whare bike te marae, ko Ash Howell ahau. Uh, e tu ana ahau, ki te whakamana ti te riti. I live humbly under the mountain Parihaka, once the largest city in New Zealand. Uh, I live together with the river Hatea, where 40% of our city's water uh, comes from, so that river really is us. Um, and pehi awari marae, uh, 116 and whare bike a few of my uh, homes here in Whangarei. And uh, I stand here to partly, among many things, uphold the agreement of Te Tiriti we signed 177 years ago. Mm. I'm also here because I would like you all to become political leaders this year by entrusting your party vote to the Green Party. There are two things that will underpin everything that we talk about here tonight. Honouring Te Tiriti and our rampant inequality. And there's one statistic that combines both of these things. The average wealth of a Pākehā or a New Zealand European in New Zealand right now is $114,000. The average wealth of a Māori in New Zealand right now is $23,000. It's an enormous difference and it's a 177 year failure. We now have 40,000 people in New Zealand homeless. We now have 329,000 of us looking for work or more work. We now have 41,000 hospitalizations every year because our homes aren't up to scratch. That's a 30-year failure. That's a nine-year failure, and it isn't good enough. And I say leaders about the Green Party because we truly are leaders in Aotearoa. This year, we've led out on cleaning up waterways, stopping water bottling, te reo in schools, renters' rights, poverty, minimum wage, manufacturing, effective freight, and housing. And now climate change. We've been talking about it for decades, and we're absolutely stoked that some of our other parties are joining us and talking about it, or at least now pretending it doesn't exist. Thank you. 
And that is what the Green Party will always, always do. We know all too well the sacrifices it takes to bring things to the fore and bring the important issues up. We know that all too well this year. But we will continue to talk about the real things. We will continue to talk about the things that others are too scared to talk about. We will continue to care about the people that others do not care about. And we will continue to lead this country into a politics that is all about care and compassion for everything and everyone. And this year I invite you all to Time. join us. Party Vote Green to ensure that whatever the new government, at its heart a party, uh, that at, it has at its heart a party that is committed to creating a land and a culture that provides for each and every person in Aotearoa, New Zealand, long into the exciting, inclusive, caring and compassionate future that deep down I know that all of you dream of. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kora, Ash. Uh, so we'd like to introduce you now to Shane Jones from New Zealand First. Shane, if you'd like to come to the lectern. Kia ora, Shane. Well. Nice to see you here. You had some problems with Auckland traffic earlier. I made an awful decision and attended a Facebook stream debate called Spin-Off. I would have been better going to the Point Chevalier Zoo than participating in that debate. I'm confident this uh, session won't be as awful as the one last night. Well, there's no, there's no animals here tonight, so that's, <laughs> that's great. Now, um, I guess what we all know about you, Shane, is that you're a, you're a former Labour candidate and you are now with New Zealand First. Uh, I've been dying to ask you this after spending so long on the red, what's it like finally being in the black? <laughs> in the middle, black and white. And the other question for you, I guess, is that you live in Kirikiri. Mm -hmm. Will you move to the fine city of Whangarei if you are a list candidate or the, the winning candidate for the Whangarei Make seat? Make me your member and I'll be your neighbour. <laughs> Righto. Over to you. Thank you very much. And you've got a bell, have you? Yeah, three minutes. Very good. Yeah, good luck. Okay. Uh, kia ora, folks. Name is Shane Jones, born and bred in Awanui. The blood of the North courses through my veins. Proud product of the Māori princess and the Dalmatian gum digger and a few itinerant uh, pioneer farmers wandering around north of the Mangamukas. Whangarei is our provincial capital, obviously a place uh, lads of my upbringing came to on a regular basis, if not for essential services, then to watch the great Sid going and in his latter years, Big Peter Jones play rugby. But why am I bothering to stand again after having been a Labour Minister in the past and having had very high-ranking positions in the, in, the, in, in the world of fishing and other international roles? I've become increasingly disenchanted with what's become of our, our overarching region and our provincial capital, Whangarei. And when the opportunity arose for me to re-engage in politics with Winston Peters, I seized it without a sliver of doubt. I think as metropolitan power, by that I mean Auckland, Christchurch, Wellington, has grown and urban power deepens and stretches further and further into the corridors of political power, we need champions in our regions. We need champions in our provincial capitals. Now, most of you have probably got a pretty good idea how you're going to vote anyway. The big parties seem to be bobbing around between 38 to 42, depending on what poll you're prepared to trust. But trust your instincts. The poll that counts is the one that will be announced on the evening of September the 23rd. Yes, it does start on Monday. September the 11th, you can start to vote. But if you want to put Whangarei at the centre of the creation of a new government, and if you want someone, in the event that God gives us via the electoral process enough votes, New Zealand First will be right in the middle, helping to create a new government. I can't guarantee whether it will be one that falls to the left or falls to the right, 
but make me your member and the things that we will accentuate and I will affirm is no more taking Whangarei for granted. No more thinking that this is the natural habitat of the Tory bird and you send a Tory bird, either ineffectual or effectual, to Wellington and they come back as apologists for Wellington to Whangarei rather than going as fighters from Whangarei to Wellington. Time. So is that three minutes? You've got about ten to so wind it up. Ten seconds, I'll wind it up. Minutes. 58 years old, had my birthday on the 3rd of September, don't bring presents tonight. Give me a present on the 23rd of September, Election Day. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, we'd like to welcome onto the stage Chris Leach, well, onto the lectern, Chris Leach from the Democrats. Chris, over to you. Democrats for Social Credit. Social welcome. Credit. Um, Chris, I was interested to, to read on your bio on... Uh, the Democrats for Social Credit website that you started out in politics helping out Joyce Ryan back in the, in the 1970s. Uh, Is that correct? Well, no, slightly earlier than that, actually. It was 1972, yep. uh, the Northern Maori by-election. And, of um, course, Joyce passed away earlier this year. She did. This year, so um, well. And it even goes back a little further than that because my, uh, my father was a candidate for Social Credit in the 1960s, 1960 and 63. Uh, and here my mother used to run a housie in those days. Houses were great fundraising things. And, um, and so uh, when I was very young, I used to be going around clearing the teacups um, at half time during the housie sessions. So my involvement in sort of political activity goes back a very long way. Fantastic. You're also a ballroom dance teacher. Yes, I am. Former national title holder. Um, the obvious question for you is, are you going to waltz in? No, I think I think I prefer to cha cha in. It's a lot more interesting <laughs> than Wilson. All right, that's enough bad bad dad jokes from me. Over to you, Chris. Thank you very much. Firstly, I want to um, congratulate the organisers um, on uh, having an interpreter here for those of you that aren't able to hear what it is that we're saying. And I want to thank her particularly for being here and giving up her time. And secondly, I want to thank um, the organisers for having all of the candidates available and participating fully in this debate. Because real democracy demands that all views are heard, not just the views of those that have taxpayer-funded resources, and them being given further advantage by being the candidates that are invited to participate in these debates. So, um, thank you, Craig and Charmaine, for having all of the candidates. And I also want to acknowledge um, Dr. Reti, um, because I think he's done a, a good job as Whangarei's MP. I think a little bit too much in the background, in my view. I think we could have heard a lot more of him. But, you know, taxpayers provide MPs with an awful lot of resources at our cost. And we should expect our MP to use those resources to make things happen in the electorate, to make the connections, to put people together, to initiate things. Because that's what they're paid for. It's their job to do that. That's why we pay them, and that's why we provide their resources. And I think Shane's done a good job in, in that regard, better than an awful lot of other MPs around the country. But I am disappointed that we still have people um, living with the dust clouds that are created by dozens of logging trucks roaring past their homes down unsealed roads every day. And that needs attention. I'm disappointed by the number of people who we have lining up for food handouts and um, being cared for by voluntary groups like churches um, and emergency housing uh, um, operators who are really left to pick up the pieces. And I think there are things there that um, could have been done better. And one of the things about that that attracted me to social credit was that social credit um, has always been innovative in terms of looking for the real cause of problems and coming up with solutions, rather than just looking at the effects of things. Um, and for instance, we were the first to talk about um, the environment back in 1973, Social Credit published a 28-page document called You and Your Environment, 
which would stand up today in terms of the things that it was talking about that we needed to do to protect our environment. Time. So what I'm um, keen to do is to be part of the three MPs that you're going to get in Whangarei this election, because you could get three if you used your votes wisely. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chris. And now we'd like to welcome to the stage Marie Minhinnick, the Next Generation candidate. Come on up, Marie. I think it might be Murray. Is it Murray? Kia ora, Murray. Kia ora. Now, uh, we don't have all our candidates here tonight. I should have mentioned earlier, we have apologies mm. from uh, Jim Taylor from the Conservatives and Robin Grieve from ACT. But um, I'm delighted to see you here, Murray, because you're arguably one of our more minor parties, if we can call it that, mm -hmm. tonight, uh, next generation. And I, I was curious, what, where were you when you decided you were going to make a decision to put yourself out there like this and be a candidate? And I'm assuming, given that you're next generation, the party, you're also the party leader. Yes. Is that right? Yes. You'd be the crime spokesman, the justice I'm spokesperson. Everything. Yeah. Everything. I you do you my must own. have very efficient meetings then in terms <laughs> of <laughs> arguments by myself. Yeah. <laughs> so just just tell us what where were you and what was the catalyst for you deciding to do this? Um, it actually goes way, way, way back. I've always dreamt of becoming a politician. So I've always dreamt of being the first Maori Prime Minister of New Zealand as well. So um, this is like a stepping stone to me getting into my, what I'm dreaming about. I mean, well, not what I'm dreaming about. I mean, yep. making my dreams come real. Kia ora. Well, good on you for putting yourself out there. Good luck with the, uh, the dream. And um, you've got three minutes. You don't have to use the whole three minutes, but um, away you go. Kia ora, everyone. Um, as you've been told, I'm Mari Minhinnick. And um, I am standing as an independent candidate for the next generation. I'm married with um, seven children. I have uh, 10 grandchildren and one new one due in November, maybe end of October, so 11. Um, I joined, I thought about the next generation quite a, the last election. I was a bit scared in coming forward because I thought, well, oh, it's a huge challenge and doing it on your own is even bigger. So what I'm, why I'm here is I'm planting the seed for the next generation because I actually don't want to see my children's children and my grandchildren and their children um, live in poverty, have no housing, um, can't afford their first home, which is unreachable at the moment, uh, rental so high um, and I think that's probably because of investors coming in and taking over and buying all our rental properties. Um, but, you know, education too, we need to look at educating our children, family values, bring back our family values, because I've, I've brought up on family values. My children have got been brought up on family values. So it's generation to generation, and I think those have gone out the door now so we don't see a lot of respect for us. We don't, um, yeah, the challenges are there, but we just seem to let it fly past. So education, employment, no employment opportunities. They say their jobs out there, but I was made redundant four times, but I still didn't go on a benefit. I went out there and I slugged out getting a job. So, you know, you just got to get off the couch, get your butt out there and, um, and want the job. So that's where I think we need to do. It's not all about giving out money for welfare or beneficiaries. It's actually implementing it into jobs with businesses and, you know, being partnership or collaborating with them. And I think if we can do that, we'll have a better um, New Zealand to live. We'll be proud of being Whangarei. And, um, yeah, I think that's probably, probably most that's of all... Thank you. I don't really know. Any, I think I probably do, but no. So that's really what all I want to do is, if you want to vote for the next generation and you want to make me as your MP for Whangarei, you need to vote because you care about 
whanganae, you care about your children, you care about your grandchildren, you care about what state, when you go on, that you know they're going to be well looked after. So that's all I'm saying for now. Thank you. Fantastic. And right on three minutes too. And let's welcome to the stage now Mr Shane Uriti for National. Kia ora Shane. Uh, kia ora Craig. Now, um, one of the interesting things that I've learned about you, and I'm sure some of our voters have as well, is that you play the guitar. I do play the guitar. And not, I try to. Not so. just uh, the acoustic, but you uh, occasionally bring out the electric guitar and the amp. <laughs> I'm actually a drummer by trade, and uh, I got tired of being the first person to band practice, last person to leave, and the bass player turns up and looks cool, just plugs in and looks like, I need to do what he's doing. <laughs> so I actually changed to guitar. How often do you get a chance while you're out on the campaign oh, trail to not, not strum very, a few tunes? Not very often here. It's turned out I've been asked to do the Waiata at more occasions than I might have expected because uh, unexpectedly suddenly it's, there's going to be a mihi whakatau here. Have we prepared a Waiata? No, nope. get Shane to do it. Get the Māori to sing. And so uh, that's me. I end there's, up doing that and I'm happy to do it. There's nothing wrong with being the Waiata go-to person. I agree, Shane. I agree. Uh, and you're still a doctor. Do you have to keep your hand in there in terms of a practising certificate yeah. or how does that work? Yeah, I'm the only uh, registered doctor in Parliament, in this current Parliament. There's normally one or two. It turns out it's only me. And uh, I maintain my practising hand. I locum still here in Whangarei. And I think a part of it is, one, I enjoy my career. But secondly, I look to be authoritative in the health space. And I wouldn't want anyone from sort of across the house or anywhere else to say, when was the last time you touched a patient? When was the last time you did after hours? So I maintain my clinical hand. Yeah. Well, and not a bad career to fall back on if you know, things yes, thank you. don't go so well. <laughs> Keep your day job, he's saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know. OK, Shane, it's over to you. Where you go? Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name's Dr Shane Reedy, and I have the privilege of being your MP. I want to acknowledge the organisers, very well organised, Craig Charmaine, thank you, and my other candidates for being here as well. I want to start by saying I'm very proud of this electorate. I'm proud to have lived here for nearly 30 years now as a local doc for 20 of those and offshore for seven years as a Harvard professor and economic development expert out of Dubai. I enjoy living in this electorate and sharing with you the highs and lows of daily life. My children were all born here, schooled here and to all those educators I say thank you for the gift that you gave my children. I'm so pleased that our community is growing and that our local economy is growing. No one's disagreeing that the economy is strong. Opposition leaders readily concede that the economy is strong. We just have differences around how to keep it that way. As an electorate, we're growing. People want to come to Whangarei. 1,500 people a year are moving to Whangarei, and this growth is revitalising our city. People are returning. Every new household in Whangarei injects $1,000 of household expenditure into our local economy every week. Food, housing, transport, and that money cycles through the Whangarei economy and supports local businesses. Jobs remain a priority. In 2014, I promised 3,000 jobs in three years. Together, we got there in two. Last year, Northland created 5,600 jobs. Many are full-time and some are not, but even 10 hours a week brings income into needy homes and makes a difference to those families. Where are those jobs? Well, they're in land-based industries like forestry, manufacturing, tourism, which is now our biggest economic driver in, uh, in the north, construction, teaching, accounting, and in medicine. We have jobs in Northland. The challenge now is how to place people into those jobs. We currently spend $12 million on trades just in Whangarei every year, and I want to work with business and tertiary providers to increase our local trade apprenticeships and use the $50 million that we recently received for getting people off benefits and into work. Let's look at what we've done together in the past three years and focus on investment in infrastructure in Whangarei and the jobs that creates. $500 million for a four-lane highway from Whangarei to Ruakaka roundabout. 50 million for a rebuild and modernisation of Whangarei Boys High. 21 million for Hundewasser, tourism infrastructure. 20 million for Portland end of life tyres and the refinery has a large shutdown next year. Having a strong economy means we can better address local issues such as housing, to which we will build 2,000 social houses in New Zealand per year. Poverty, which the family incomes package will improve and meth addiction, which the new $3 million Northland DHB, Northland Police Collaboration to Ara Oranga will address. The last statement I want to make is to our rural community. 
and it sets a policy difference between us. Sorry. This government recognises the backbone that is farming and we will support you. So in summary, I'm very proud of this electorate. I love living here. I'm proud to be your hard-working MP and I'm asking for your support on September 23rd. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Got a shame. And finally, Tony Savage for Labour. Would you like to come forward? Thanks. <coughs> You did say no dad, dad jokes, Craig. Oh dear. I was going to ask you if Labour had rung you up because you've got the same surname as uh, a very famous Michael Joseph Savage, a former PM. Well, you're quite right. Uh, Michael Joseph Savage did form the welfare state for this country, and I certainly stand in those footsteps. And uh, we do little, want to put a little bit of Savage back into Labour. But uh, I'm no direct relation. We're both out of Ireland, but that's about as close as it goes. I, I guess with a name like Savage, you really only have one choice that's when right, it came to choosing choice. a party. Well, it's also the identification of the values as well. Fantastic. All right, Tony, All right, the floor is yours. I'd like to thank the organisers uh, and my other candidates. Uh, this is, is not easy to come up and talk to you. This election should be about hope, about together how we can build a better future, better schools, better health, affordable housing, clean rivers, more opportunity and a better world for us all. But instead of about hope, this election has become about trust, scaremongering with fake news. But it should be, it should not be about trust because the conversation New Zealanders want to have is about the future, about a vision, for a fairer, more decent New Zealand we can all be proud of. Under successive Labour governments, we used to be a world leader for the best of reasons. Now we're a world leader for the worst of reasons. Ask yourself, is this the New Zealand you really want to grow up in? Is this the New Zealand you want your children to grow up in? The government pretends that run, this, uh, running the country is like running a business. Well, a business needs leadership, a strategy, a vision, and there is none. But most of all, it needs its people, its profit creators, that are prepared to get stuck in and build wealth, where the many can enjoy the benefit of success, and not just the few. And sadly, New Zealanders no longer believe their government is for them. And why would they with this new political speak? Where shabby old prefabs are now, what is it, modern learning environments? Where some humans are more equal than other humans? Me, you, them, which ones? And when a failed economist can find an $11 billion hole but no one else can, and then doubles down on the deceit. Where the only response is to scare you about new non-existent taxes, whilst the government invests less and less in you and gives it to the rich so it trickles down to the rest of us. Or perhaps a newly minted poverty target that after nine years is all about statistics and nothing about making lives actually better. Sadly, as a lawyer, I get to see the desperate poverty and homelessness here in Whangarei in increasing numbers. Time. And news face, Dr Retty, an extra 10.77 per week will not take anybody out of poverty. We can choose to make a better Whangarei and a better New Zealand, and under Labour, that's exactly what we'll do. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. We'd like to introduce to you now and uh, a segment about the, the business and what we can plan to see or what we hope to see. Uh, I'd like to invite up onto the stage our Northland Chamber of Commerce CEO, Tony Collins. Tony, if you'd like to come forward and ask some of those business questions of our candidates tonight. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks for coming along and uh, making yourself available for tonight. I just thought I'd frame a bit of, give a bit of frame behind where these questions have come from. So we've gone out and we've surveyed our members 
And what we've found is, although there's real strong interest in the obvious questions, there's also a whole underlying uh, number of questions which our members in the business community want to know. And I guess that's because for the business community in particular, they're interested in things like um, you know, freedom of enterprise, their own personal aspirations, but they're also interested in how the scarce resources get um, allocated and who wins, who loses, but also in the recognition of the risk that these individual people take in their day-to-day -day life to generate wealth, but also opportunities for everyone in our community. So that's sort of framework where these questions have come from. So um, you may be surprised because they may not be the, the kind of questions you'd expect to come out of a business community, but this is what they are. So move over, Tony. So I'm going I'm to hang around with you. The first you? one. Yeah. I thought you were going to dance. We can do cha cha. We're both small enough. We can share this. So do I? Who, Ash up first. Ash, can I? So the first question probably comes out of that framework about, and it's probably really pertinent to Whangarei and to Northland, and it's about growth and it's about population. So the question is, um, you know, what are your views on what the right size population is for New Zealand? Um, what would it look like and why? Well, the Greens believe that the population of any country needs to be mediated against the carrying capacity of the eco ecology of the land. You know, if we're not producing enough off our land here to live here, then there's too many people. At the moment, we can't, our system doesn't even provide for the people who do live here. We, what the Greens are focused on is remaking the system so it provides for everyone that lives here already. We've got a system that creates low-grade pro products off our land and exports them out of the country as quick as we can. We need to change what we do with our land so it produces a diversity of goods and we need to install a Minister of Manufacturing, which the Greens will do, to create high-value goods so that we again have need for jobs and high-skilled labour. Once we've been able to do that, then we have meaningful work for many people in our country. That means we're producing a much more off our land and the carrying capacity of our land goes up. And this needs to be contextualised within the context of that the world will have 9 billion people in it in 2050. We need to be looking after ourselves now, not that when we haven't been doing that in the last 30 years. We need to be looking, at, looking after ourselves now because we want to be making these decisions because 20, 30, 40 years from now, we won't be the ones making these decisions. The rest of the world will be because we are going to be packed with people. We need to be ahead of the curve on this. Currently, we're not, and we need to look after our own here first. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, so Shane, can I please ask a question of you? So th once again, this is um, part of that underpinning the, the risk and reward of uh, freedom of enterprise and that allocation of scarce resources, and it's around the social outcome. So what I'm interested in what you know, social outcome baselines and acceptable standards of living um, you believe the country should be um, experiencing. I think it's extraordinary after nine years, initially with the leadership of John Key, we've ended up with these awful statistics of homelessness, a huge growth in the gap between the haves and the have-nots, an extraordinary increase in the number of foreign interests that are purchasing our very, very important scarce resources. And look, unless we address those issues, then irrespective of how much wealth you and I create individually, if we are undermining and leaving frayed the bonds that really bring us together in a civic sense, we are going to bequeath to our children an awful society. I'm the first to agree because I am pro-industry. I'm pro-fishing, I'm pro-mining, I'm pro-forestry, I'm pro-growth. Now, I accept that they have to be statutory frameworks, but unless we create surplus, unless we create wealth, there is no way that we can afford the things that we're taking for granted. And the safety net must be maintained, but in my view, unless you have a pro-growth, pro-development narrative for Whangarei and for the North, we will not generate and enough surplus to deal with, unfortunately, what are the social casualties from the current model that has passed for the last nine years. So I'm pro-industry. Thank you. Thank 
Chris, welcome. Chris, um, once again, you, you know, I think um, you've spoke about in your opening address, what we're really interested in, what, what to you would be, um, how would you measure effective government investment? Um, <coughs> firstly, Tony, my, my apologies for having missed you out earlier in, um, in uh, acknowledging the people who put this meeting together. I'm my just another, another bald guy in a suit, it's easy to miss. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're saying there's too many of us around. <laughs> Um, the, look, f for me, the measure of um, what is good government investment, how do you measure the, um, the benefits of it, come down to, um, to one thing. It's very simple. And that is, is what has been done good for people? If it's not, if it's only good for industry and it's not good for the rest of society, then it's not successful. If it's only good for one sector of society, it's not successful. If it's only good for those who can speculate on the stock market and the money markets, it's not successful. And if it creates more in the way of pollution and, and other kind of environmental problems, um, then it's not successful. So it comes down to what is good for people. Thank you. Kia ora, Māori. Kia ora. Hey, um, you spoke earlier about your, the troubles you'd had getting work and about mm. the need for young people, next generations, to continue to be able to get work. So what I'd be really interested in, you know, what skills baseline does a well-educated, adaptive workforce need for the changing business environment? So what's going to make it available for these young kids to get work in the future? Um, <coughs> I think... Um, Going back to my history, I think um, at schools we did have woodwork and cooking and sewing and all these other things that were basic skills for at home and working out in the, like living out in the community. But for me um, and for the kids who need to get a job and I was made redundancy, it's uh, you've a, you actually got to calculate what your skills are. And if you, and then you've got to put yourself into that, that job description. And sometimes you can't always have everything. So, and I don't think they, the employers expect you to have all those aspects. So what you've got to lo look at is what are the main features you need to have in the job description. And just set up your, firstly, get your CV done. Make, it, make sure that it's brief and clear. Make sure that you go to do some tertiary or um, studies or depends on what you're doing. So for me, I went back to University of Auckland and I did a postgraduate diploma in business because I thought if I'm going to come here and be an independent candidate for the next generation, I need to know how businesses work out there. Yeah. So that's sort of the way. You, you've got to sort of do your own pathway and what you want to do, not what the employer wants you to do, what you want to do. And you fit yourself in there, but you need to go and get those skills from other places to get to A, B and C. And then, yeah, and then that'll make you become more successful in other jobs, which I have been headhunted since I've had um, my tohu. Okay. Thanks, Murray. Thank you. Got a shame. Oh, yeah. um, I guess, you know, things are changing and business is not as usual anymore. So the question is, um, as we grow and as our population grows and everything else changes, you know, how do we keep ahead of the game? How do we move from a reactive framework to a more proactive one, particularly within the business environment? And the mm, good, thank you. Uh, how do we move from a, uh, a reactive to a proactive environment? I think there's several things. I think uh, as a country we need to make sure that we're at the founding stage of important regional organisations and regional frameworks. For example, last year we signed up to the Asian Investment Infrastructure Bank. Now this is a bank that's going to be very important for the region, it's actually going to compete for funds with the World Bank and New Zealand had an opportunity to be a founding member. We put our hand up to that and that gives us privileges. 
The privileges we get with that are New Zealand companies get to bid on some of that infrastructure. We get to set some of the rules for really important development in the Asian Pacific region. And also, we get to collaborate with really important strategic allies, sometimes not even infrastructure related. So I think to be proactive, for us, we need to be early and uh, really uh, forward thinking around the Asia Pacific organisations that we become a part of. And I think that's a good example. I think what we also need to do is define what we're world leaders at. We don't build cars. It's not what we're good at. But what are we world leaders at? How do we wrap the IP so that no one can take it? And then how do we continue to lead that out so that we're leaders in those industries so that no one follows, so that everyone follows, say again, and we lead? Well, let me give you some examples. We're leaders at farming practices, livestock improvement. We're leaders at kiwifruit. We're leaders with food safety. If we can continue to be leaders in the world, then we will be proactive. Others will be reacting to us. Now, to do that, we're going to need to continue to innovate. And that's where we've got funds like the Primary, Gro uh, Primary Growth Fund Partnership and Callaghan Institute that keep us in front of those areas that we're good at. So I think if we're going to be proactive, we need to be proactive with areas that we have expertise and let the others follow us. Thank you. Um, Tony, um, obviously an issue for business in particular is, is the cost of doing business. A lot of that cost comes around uh, compliance, and that compliance is often um, exacted by local government, but it's uh, brought about through central government. So the question here is, you know, how do you ensure that local government is adequately funded to deliver the roles delegated by central government that are accountably clear? Thank you, Tony. Um, there is a uh, report that the Local Government uh, Commission and the Local Government people came out with last year, and I was actually reading that this morning, funny enough. Um, and I had a look at some of the uh, stats, and it's interesting to note that transport and roading is about 29% of budgets of local councils, and water is about 14%. So put those together, it's roughly half of their budget. All the other stuff, uh, bureaucracy is, is quite a big one as well. But uh, so you, the, thing, the first thing to do is, is look at the things that matter, the roading and the water budgets. And you already know our policy regarding water to repatriate some of the money we're going to get back from cleaning up the rivers to councils to help them out. So we need to develop an effective partnership is, is the answer uh, between local government and central government around shared goals and strategies uh, for activities for local government to pursue. And, and one of the things I've also been looking at, it's particularly uh, important here in Whangarei, is the rating system. The rating system seems to be uneven, unfair. There are a number of properties that aren't rated that, that could be. So I think we need to relook at how they're funded. Um, so I think an appropriate funding mix will give those councils greater tools. And uh, obviously, we need to take away some of the bureaucratic process that's, that's uh, come about because of a cult of sort of narcissistic leadership that uh, the current, current government has been uh, developing and simplify and get it out to the people that are doing stuff. And I know uh, the, uh, the unions, and particularly the PSA, has been doing fantastic work in terms of a partnership together that gets the resources out to the people that are doing it. Thank you. Tony? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Tony Savage, and thank you, Tony, from the Chamber of Commerce. Right, Charmaine. This, this is our section for uh, our readers who have written in with questions to the Northern Advocate. Craig, I'm going to definitely leave this one over to you. So um, our readers have written in. They've got questions for our candidates tonight. Craig's written them down. Let's um, see how they fly. So most of these questions were generic questions, funnily enough. Uh, one was specific, and there was one that I felt suited a particular candidate. So um, we'll, we'll see how that that plays out. But Mr Holwell, if you could join us on stage, that'd be wonderful. Uh, you received a question that was specific to you, and I think it gives you an opportunity to uh, explain part of what you and the Greens are about. It's from o Oliver Crowman at One Tree Point, and she says that you are a well-known and respected community member. And you were, you're not related to her at all, are you? Not no. enough. And you were running for mayor last year. Why are you now campaigning for the Green Party vote only 
and not contesting the electorate vote. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, that's been a long-standing thing for the Greens. We are contesting one, ca one candidacy in New Zealand at the moment, in Nelson, because we believe Nick Smith has to go. Um, we also... Yeah. Thank you. And the last time we had an uh, electorate candidate in, it was Jeanette Fitzsimmons in Coromandel. We had that because one person um, donated their time for six months and door knocked for six months. Once she was in, the national government changed the electorate borders ran, and ran a smear campaign for many years to get her out. The Green Party spent half of their campaign budget for the whole country in just the Coromandel that year because of the dirty tactics. We haven't, been, uh, we haven't wanted to engage in that anymore, and it's also because we believe in our team. Our team is incredibly strong. James Shaw was asked to run for all three of the top par big parties when he came back and he chose only the Greens. We've got um, two 23-year-olds in line to become uh, MPs, the youngest MP in 42 years, uh, because we believe truly that the youth need representation. We've got seven women in our top 10 because that starts to uh, change the, or, or work against the proportion that's in Parliament at the moment. And at 24, we've got a good mate of mine who was um, nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his work banning cluster bombs around the world, and he can only get to 24 on the Greens list. So the reason is because we back our team completely. I'm 29 on the list, and I assure you that the 28 people ahead of me all deserve to be there. Thanks, Ash. Awesome. Shane Jones. Shane, if you'd like to come forward for your reader question. You have a randomly drawn question, Mr Jones. <laughs> because it starts off to all candidates, but you were the lucky punter to, to draw this one. It's about tyres, and it's from someone called John Round, so I hope that's not a fake name if Mr Round is here. Can you assure voters who use State Highway 1 that the used tyres that will be used in Golden Bay Cements furnaces will come by rail and not road? Portland has a rail link, so this makes sense. And Mr. Round has done some calculations. On my estimation, 3 million tyres equates to 24 truck movements a day, five days per week for 50 weeks, assuming 500 tyres per load. And then he said, and yes, we want the rail line to Auckland upgraded to take containers. Oh, thank you, John, for that question. I've actually been out and had a briefing um, from the Portland management, and I do need to acknowledge the... Um, sitting member Dr. Retty for um, prevailing upon Dick's, um, uh, Nick Smith. You may be the only human being that succeeded in that regard. <laughs> but those tyres will not come on rail. Those tyres, I'm confident, if what we were told at Portland by their management is the truth, will actually reduce the carbon output associated with the creation of the product at Portland. But there is no agenda at all in the current government to redevelop or rehabilitate rail. I know that, you know that. They've got their justification for it. That's why you're going to vote for them or against them. But so the, the particular question as to how many of those tyres, and I did ask this, will come on road I was told they do not expect any of them to come on rail. If you don't like that, then don't vote for it. Chris Leach, if you'd like to come forward for your ready questions, thanks. Hi again, Chris. Hi. This question is from Richard Easton. Richard says that Sea levels are expected to rise. What are the plans, the flood plans, for the town basin? And importantly, the upcoming Huntervasa building. For when the rising sea levels and associated flooding occurs, occurs. Are the candidates in denial of climate change and of such an event ever happening? Well, it sounds to me like we could have the greatest um, tourist attraction in the world, doesn't it? We'd have a floating Hondavasa um, <laughs> centre, and there, there's not another one like it anywhere in the world. So um, we, could, we could make a killing in tourism from that. Um, 
I can't, uh, I can't say what the council are doing about uh, plans for protecting the town basin uh, and its environs in the case of rising sea levels. That's something someone would have to ask the council. But what I do know is that, that um, New Zealand can only make a very small dent in the uh, world sense as far as its contribution to climate change is concerned. Uh, yes, we can do some things. Uh, we can do, for instance, um, what Christchurch has just announced, where they have uh, an electric car fleet that is going to be shared by businesses in the city so that they can use the car to get from A to B and, and then someone else will use it to get from B to C and so forth, so that we don't have an enormous amount of downtown land being taken up with car parks, because that's what we do. Um, not so much in Whangarei, although we do. Most of us um, tend to drive cars into the middle of town. We park it and leave it there all day and go to work, and then we come back and we take the journey home. So we're providing parking spaces. So we could, we could improve on that by using the ride-sharing um, system. But to me, the biggest thing that we could do is act as leaders for the rest of the world um, by changing our economic system to one that doesn't demand continual growth in order to keep the system going, because that's what our current system does. We have to keep producing more, which is why we've got an environmental problem with the number of cows that we've got on our land. We've actually overstocked the land past its ability to handle. And that's because of the economic system, which continually demands that we have to pay enormous amounts of interest on every bit of money that we borrow to develop our businesses. Um, it's why there is massive deforestation in, in Indonesia um, and South America, because we've got to produce much more in the way of palm kernel to feed those animals on our land that we've overstocked. So we've got to deal with the economic situation, and that's the one thing that social credit has got that no other party will will touch. They're not prepared to look at it, they're not prepared to do anything about it, and social credit is the only one that will. And Thank it's worked before. Thanks, Chris. An excellent segue there from <laughs> the environment to uh, finance plans. Now, before you join us, Murray, we're just going to go off script a little bit, because it would seem criminal to ask an environmentally related question, and we have the Green Party candidate here True. with very positive body language leaning forward, so we're going to offer him a very, would you like just to have a quick response to that question? Um, yes, there will be some uh, coastal areas that are impacted by it, but the, the real issue is actually our stormwater infrastructure. Our stormwater infrastructure has been neglected for the last 30 years. We haven't been able to afford to do anything with it under our system in which we sold all our assets. So we now have a really great opportunity because if we'd done it 15 to 20 years ago, we wouldn't have updated it with the, with the, um, the recent sea level rise kind of calculations. So we get to do it again. So the, yes, Town Basin and some of these coastal areas are an issue, but our stormwater infrastructure runs right through our cities, right through them, and they're going to be affected. And so are all of our ecosystems as well, our river ecosystems. We already have sharks and dolphins coming up the Whanganui River because it's salinating backwards up the river. That's, an, that's a complete change in our ecological system when our, all our riverways start salinating again. It's a massive issue, and it's not just res re restricted to the coast, and we've been talking about it for years. Thank you, Ash. <laughs> Would any other candidates like to offer a view on that one? No? Great. All right, Mari, the podium is yours. I should ask you a question, shouldn't I, Mari? Yes. Uh, Mari, your question is one that's uh, been topical for a little while now, and it's about in extreme circumstances, assisted dying. And the, the question simply, and it's come from a couple of people, Mary Johnston from Nongaru mm. and Robin Leifring. Uh, the question is simply, would you support assisted dying? And in particular, would you vote for it if David Seymour's end of life choice bill is introduced? What's your view on assisted dying? Um. Myself, I, I would not um, make it legal to assist in dying, um, assist with um, any patient who wants to die. Um, I, I, know the, I know the circumstances and the diagnosis, whether it's cancer or anything else. Um, this is, it's a tremendous 
you know, people go through a tremendous pain when they are dying and they, there's no cure. Um, but there is places, there is a, um, a place where you can get care services and the pain medication to actually um, ass and, and assist with making, oh, hang on, um, this is really hard to, so that they can still live a really good life to the end. Um, so I, I don't think anyone needs to die in needless pain and suffering as care is, you know, um, available for all of them, no matter what it is, where it is, whenever. So, and I know it puts a real big um, pressure on the whanau, um, immediate families, extended whanau out there. I mean, I think sometimes we think about when we're seeing our loved one lying there in pain and they've already had pain medication and they're wanting to die, I think that's sort of like a mindset to me because when I'm really sick or, you know, we go, I want to die. So, you know, um, in that kind of sense, when you see a patient that is dying, it's probably sort of in that sort of closure. Um, but I think it is based on age too, you know, because we have young children who um, are dying and have cancer as well at a young age and all other things that we go through. So I would say, for me, I think I'll take my whanau or my husband or wife or daughter or auntie and uncle back home to their own house, their own environment, and live the rest of their beautiful life with everyone that they love and, and the precious things that they, precious people that they um, have always, yeah, continuously been there for them. That's it. Thank you, Murray. Thank you, Murray. So we're going to give our other candidates an opportunity to answer that question, um, just because we have had a couple of readers write in. Uh, Mr. Leach, your view on assisted dying? Um, my view is that I would much rather have a situation where I didn't have to jump off a tall building in order to end my life if my situation was as bad as that. I would much rather not have to crash my car into a tree um, in order to end my life. I would much rather be able to have the opportunity to end my life with some dignity and not put my family through uh, the awful situation of the two examples I've described. So I'm in favour of assisted dying. I think it needs to have a lot of safeguards put in place, but I think that's possible. Thank you, Chris. Come to our Labour candidate on the end here. Uh, thank you, Craig. I uh, have been in uh, that situation with relatives and uh, will be in the future. It's hugely, hugely, hugely emotional and uh, we just need to have a careful conversation about this a, a lot more and, and talk about it a lot more and do a lot more research until we dis before we decide. Yeah, thank you. So assisted suicide, also known, or assisted dying, also known as physician-assisted dying, that's me. Uh, that is, I'm the person who you're asking to provide you with the mechanism to, to end your life. I want to provide two responses. I want to provide a New Zealand response and my own personal view. I'm able to offer a New Zealand response because I'm privileged to sit on the Health Select Committee and we formed an inquiry around euthanasia. This committee received more submissions than any other inquiry ever in the history of Parliament. We received 20,000 submissions. It was the Marion Street uh, petition. 20,000 submissions. We had 1,000 people face to face and we travelled all over the country. Absolutely harrowing and emotionally draining the expressions and the observations and the history and the stories that people wanted to tell us. It was one of the most draining select committees I've ever been on. We printed our report uh, about six weeks ago. It was a majority report. There was one minority report. One, one party wanted to go to referendum. But otherwise, across the House, uh, the majority report showed that 80% of New Zealanders who submitted to this inquiry were not in favour of changing the law. So that's, that's a summary of where New Zealand seems to sit at the moment. My own personal position, I spent a whole career nurturing and caring for life, and I'm just not able to turn that away. 
Thank you very much. Before I go to our last two candidates, it's worth mentioning that if our MPs were asked to vote on this, it would be a conscience vote, which would allow them the leeway to veer away from the party line and, and vote from their own personal views. Uh, Mr Jones. The position of my party is that it ought not to be a decision taken by parliamentarians and after a due process, it should be left to a referendum. But if Providence smiles upon me and I am back in Parliament, I will never, ever vote for a euthanasia bill. Uh, yeah, the Greens are opposed to the current bill in Parliament by an act uh, that allows for also medical conditions to be uh, applicable for assisted dying as well. Um, I've been up and spoke to Warwick Jones, the medical uh, director at hospice at length about this, and there is a specific difference between assisted dying and turning off life support systems. Assisted dying is when you're working to basically commit uh, medically assisted or physician assisted suicide, and this is a far different line to um, turning off systems that is essentially keeping people alive uh, through big support systems. Um, so no to assisted suicide, um, and potentially we need to have the discussion about when we turn off life support systems to people amongst, as a country and also as Fano and friends. Thank you, Ash. Okay, who have we got next up to the lectern? Charmaine, I think it might be I've Shane Ritty. Yeah. Sorry, Mari Manhunnick? We've had Mari. How could I forget we've had Mari? Mr. Ritty, come on up. Now this is a question that you'll be familiar with because the, the reader has touched on a subject that you've actually been working on during the three years that you've been in Parliament and um, I, we figured it was a good opportunity just to update everybody on where this is at. What are you going to do about the awful service which Air New Zealand is giving the people of Whangarei <laughs> through Whangarei Airport? <laughs> there are so few flights now and they are timed so poorly it is impossible to get to a main centre in New Zealand and back again in one day during business hours. Kitty Kitty Airport is much better served. Why? Paul Martin asks. That's a great question. We do indeed have an appalling service, have done for a number of years. Uh, okay, so uh, I was aware of this. Actually, I, I drive to Auckland a number of times just because of the logistics of me getting there, so it, it's occasional that I would use the route from here, so this is not me just sort of wanting a better service for myself. Um, our Air New Zealand service locally has been poor for a long, long time, and uh, what we did was, and what I was able to work with, I was able to work with uh, your chair, the Chamber of Commerce chair, and uh, bring together community and business people and actually leverage and approach here in New Zealand. Now, before I did that, because I'm totally aware that uh, government is the main shareholder in Air New Zealand, and so a number of people have said to me, well, look, you're the main shareholder. Why don't you just lean on them? So that's, that's kind of complex, okay? We try to have an arm's length from what we call independent organisations like Air New Zealand so that politicians don't meddle and influence their own personal interests. But the shareholding minister uh, was Bill English at that time, so I sent him a text. Bill, I'm really unhappy with the service to Whangarei and I want permission to lean on them. He came back to me and said, go for it. So I worked with the chamber, worked with community, worked with business people, and we formulated a plan as to how we might approach Air New Zealand and say, simply not good enough. That included things like going to Barrier Air, who no one knew actually got a night flying licence about six months ago. And we talked to them and said, could you bring in some competition? Can we lean on Air New Zealand that way? That's a little bit more complex because you quite like your bags to go from your regional flight straight on to your next flight. It's a little bit complex. But so if we could bring leverage on Air New Zealand, let's do it. So Shane, if I can just ask a question at this point then. Are you saying that it has improved? Or is it still a work in progress? It's, it has improved, and I'll tell you the one reason why it's improved. It's definitely a work in progress. I think there's two things with our local Air New Zealand. They're not receptive to the schedule we want, and they're not reliable. At least do one of those. How about give us a schedule that works, and at least be reliably bad, you know, consistently don't turn up on time. That'd be a good thing. Air New Zealand shouted at me in December, shouted at me down the phone, you're politicising uh, flights into Whangarei. No, I'm not. You need to give us a reliable schedule and you need to give us a, uh, a schedule that works. I'll tell you what the difference is then. The new thing is they've now got a, a plane that stays overnight 
and that was what they were trying to save costs on. Great. It stays overnight, but man, there's still a lot to do. Well, I'm, I'm in danger of getting into trouble with your fellow candidates for allowing you to politicise the issue right you now. Can, you can see so I'm passionate about this. Thank you very much okay, for, thank the, you. for the answer. Thank Cheers. You. And Tony. Tony Savage. Oh, we've got a great question for you, Tony. I should say, as, a, uh, as the former president of the Whangarei Frying Club and a pilot, should have asked me about airports. Go. Did not know. <laughs> this isn't about airports, but it's at another end of the spectrum. Superannuation. Ah. Mm-hmm. Right. This is, a, uh, this is the longest question of the evening. Ah. But... Um, <laughs> always, always expect one from Jonesy. I think the crowd are going to like this one. I wouldn't be surprised if there may be rotten fruit thrown or applause. We'll see oh. what happens. The question is from Grant McDermott. Here we go. Apart from National saying that if they are elected, they will give a married couple an extra $13 per week, is this net or after tax? And there's no mention about a single person. What do other parties have planned for national super? At present, national super is pathetic. In the last cost of living adjustment on April 1, April Fool's Day, I got $5.44 net a week, which I consider an insult. I have worked for 56 years. I have been taxed during the time that I worked up until the age of 73, and I retired last year. At present, I get $395.20 net per week. I know there is talk about increasing the age of retirement. It has been stated that with a lot more people coming up for retirement, national super could be hard to sustain. But with all the election promises being made, which will cost millions, if not billions, isn't it time that the people who have worked hard to help make this country what it is today were better looked after? Well, I don't know what the National Party uh, political platform is. I haven't read it and I don't believe it. <laughs> so you'll have to ask Dr Shane Retty whether it's before or after tax or whether it's going to happen at all. But well, let's, get, let's get clear about what superannuation is. It's not a benefit or something you haven't earned. It is a delayed payment for work already done. It is a delayed payment by profit creators. You know, businesses, I'm a businessman, we don't employ people unless you make a profit for us. And part of that profit we make, we put aside, and it's called superannuation. You have already earned it. And that is why we're not going to raise the level of superannuation, the age of superannuation, 65. But you all know that we're getting older, and that's cost more costly. It's costing the, the health system a lot more, and it's not keeping up, as we know from the DHB here that's in desperate straits. And we started the KiwiSaver. Put the money in digitally, di diligently, diligently, diligently. If we had kept that, we would have had a huge investment fund that would have allowed us to invest in infrastructure and more in you. But the national government cut it as soon as they came in. So we're going to put in, as soon as we get in power, a couple of weeks away, let's hope, with your help, then, uh, uh, I might be dreaming on, but let's see what the poll is today, does anyone know? Um, then we're going to put those contributions back in to make sure that we can keep up with the superannuation payments and ensure that you get paid what you've already earned. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Do we have any other candidates who would like to engage on the superannuation question? Okay, so um, uh, this uh, reader is absolutely right. The uh, superannuation is indexed to the cost of living, and uh, the cost of living and inflation has been quite low. So it was a small increase, but it was to reflect the cost of living. What isn't mentioned here, though, is that the superannuation is also indexed to wage growth, 66% of the average wage. And what's happened to wage growth in New Zealand since 2008? Well, actually, we're the fourth fastest wage growth economy in the OECD. So much so that, in fact, wages have grown by 11% more than inflation from 2008. So, yes, there was a small increase on 1 April for CPI, CPI adjustment, but because wages have been quite a bit above CPI, the superannuitants actually get more than just the cost of inflation. I agree, still challenging. There are many who still struggle on that, but just need to make the point that there's actually two indexing of superannuation. Thank you. 
Chris, did you want? Thank you, Shane. Chris Leach. Well, frankly, I'm sick and tired of hearing people, commentators and people on stages saying we can't afford superannuation the way it is and we can't afford to put it up. Look, let's, let's get real here. The government currently spends four and a half thousand million dollars every year paying the interest bill on its borrowing. If you want to put it in simple terms, four and a half billion. But it's four and a half thousand million. Now, why don't we get sensible like Japan does? Japan has cut its government debt in half in the last five years. And how's it done it? It's got the money that it needs from its own central bank, so it's not paying all the interest bill that it has previously been paying. So there's no reason why New Zealand couldn't do exactly the same thing. Instead of borrowing from commercially owned overseas banks, most of them Australian, it could get the money it needs from its reserve bank. Any interest that it paid would come back to the government anyway because it owns the reserve bank in the first place. That's number one. Number two, the reason we can't afford it also is because at the moment the money markets are um, the biggest gambling casino in the world, where New Zealand dollar is the most ninth most traded currency in the world. The money markets in New Zealand have about $50 million go through them every day. $50 million every day. Now, if we really wanted to do something about finding the money, we would tax some of that trading on money markets and in derivatives and all the other funny financial instru uh, instruments that the speculators get involved in. If we did some of that, we could produce more than enough money to pay superannuation at a decent rate without putting the level up and do a whole lot of other things as well. Thank you, Chris. 30 seconds. No one should leave this building doubting the commitment of Winston Peters and New Zealand First over the entire life of the party to the needs and interests of superannuitants. Secondly, I don't want to steal my leader's thunder. I've already had a text telling, uh, being told not to swear. Unfortunately, it was sent to Paddy Gow. The last time I was here, of course, it was a spelling mistake. He meant, my leader meant to say, don't, not don't swear, don't sweat. Major announcements being made by him over the weekend about superannuation. And with all due respect to my fellow candidates, the National wants to put up the uh, retirement or oh, the superannuation in 2037, so it actually only applies to me here, and the Greens will not be putting it up. <laughs> Thank you, Ash. Now, um, one of the beauties of when you organise a meeting is that you can depart from the script sometimes. So yep. I'm just going to mention something that is topical because um, your local media and national media today have received a, a letter from the chair of the Northland DHB Consumer Council. And to, to, to describe what is happening in simple terms, it's complex, uh, but our DHB because of what they say is a funding cap, is getting $8 million less in funding than they believe they should be uh, this financial year, based on what they understand the population of Northland to be. So I'm sure that our candidates have been aware of this issue which has been brewing over the past couple of weeks, and we'd like to hear them uh, just quickly, concisely, if we could, on, uh, on their view on why are we being capped in terms of our funding? Is that their, your understanding is correct, we're missing out on $8 million, which would be hugely beneficial to Northland, mm. to Whangarei. And what can be done about it? Ash Owl. I believe the funding cap is in relation to extra payments around Christchurch. Shane um, explained it to us the other night. But I was at the regional hospital last time I was there. The emergency department, in the, in the month following my visit there, had 100 empty shifts it couldn't fill or couldn't afford to fill. The whole system, let alone the $8 million or $8 billion a year, is grossly underfunded anyway because our current system doesn't focus on it in any way and our government doesn't focus on it. The Greens have always been focused on a healthcare system that provides proper healthcare for everyone and we'll continue to fight for that forever. Thanks, Ash. Uh, folks, another sessions we have had this question 
and uh, probably not going to aid my cause, but I must acknowledge Shane Retty, who um, clinically took the audience through the reasons for the shortfall. He did put the audience to sleep, but he was clinically accurate. So most of the uh, technical information, uh, Dr. Shane, uh, we've got no compunction about leaving it to you. But there's a, th there's a deeper issue I want you to think about. Number one, if you are reliant upon regionally provincial public funded health services, over the last nine years, they have continued to deteriorate. Possibly because metropolitan power is outstripping the power that you have here. If you want to turn that around, create some political leverage. It's not just about $8 million. The CEO of the health department, that chap should have been sacked on the spot. They made that mistake, but put that to the side. Lead this meeting saying, OK, how can I maximise some political leverage at this election so that my politician has power where the allocation of capital takes place? right inside the cabinet, right inside Treasury. That's why I'm saying to you, overlook the $8 million, which is shocking, but buy yourself some real political power and insurance. Vote for the shame. Well, we've heard the, um, the figure of eight, 8 million. It's actually, over the last three years, it's actually 30 million that the Northland DHB has been short on, which is the reason that they won't sign off on their annual report to the Minister. Now, caps are all fine. They sound great and they, you can justify them, but caps on funding are all about just having a reason to say that we're not going to allocate the money because the formula that we've got doesn't work. Well, who made up the formula? It was fine for the government to spend $30 million on a flight of fancy to have a referendum on a flag that nobody wanted. But we can't find $30 million for the Northern DHB. It's fine for the government to do its banking business with ANZ and Westpac, two Australian-owned banks, so that millions of dollars worth of fees gets funneled off to the profits of overseas shareholders. Why isn't the government doing its banking through Kiwi Bank? because it owns Kiwi Bank, and those millions of dollars would go back to the government in profits from Kiwi Bank to be spent on our health system. Dr Reddy, one, one point that we've, we've had it pointed out that you are possessed of much technical knowledge on the subject, and I'm, I'm sure you're open to people approaching you after if they want to know more, sure. but in a, in a concise sure. scenario, what do you understand to be the situation? Sure. How can it be improved? Um, so very generally, how we come to this situation is uh, with Christchurch, where there were large shifts of people, uh, it was decided that there should be a 5% cap, so that if people move to a new region, regardless of how many move there, you wouldn't get more than 5% above what you got last year. That's fundamentally what's catching us. Because we're basically such a popular electorate, such a popular region, actually, We've had more people move to Northland, so much so that we've hit that 5% cap. That's fundamentally what it means. Um, is the number 8 million? Yes, it is. I was uh, made aware of this about four months ago. I have a very uh, good working relationship with the CEO of Northland DHB. In fact, we trained together. He's an excellent CEO. Uh, he was a doc before he was a CEO, and that talks to uh, leaders who are clinicians. I think it's, it's a, another story. but. Uh, so yes, I've been aware of this for three to four months and uh, I've been working very hard with officials right down at the dark, dirty detail. That's the advantage of knowing what PBFF is called the population funding formula. Knowing those details, I can make that argument to officials in a way that they can't easily wriggle out. They have with some of the arguments I've made. I've discussed it with very senior people and I have to say it's a work in progress that I'm still working on. Have I made substantial progress? Well, we came into the election period, so to this point, no, I have not. But do I intend to fight very hard for the Northland DHB? Absolutely. And can I use the words and the technical language that the officials want to use against you? Absolutely as well. Okay? Thank you. It's not just about money. I know from talking to the staff at the DHB hundreds and hundreds of them that they're under untold pressure and they're sick of it. And there's a lot of problems going on in there. The basic problem is, 
what all the models that Dr. Reddy talked was about is not enough money has been put into health. Look, I've had doctors come to me to say, we're going out of business, we can't recruit people. No one's gonna come up here. You're not gonna get the primary care you need. We need to put more money into public health. This is a strategy of the government to start privatising your health and sell it off to the rich fat cats. Okay, so you would have all come in and on your way in been given um, this great little brochure. Not now, but when you go to leave tonight, this is going to be your opportunity to uh, just show us, I, I suppose you'd call it, like a a straw vote of what we can anticipate is going to happen with our candidates over the next little while. Based on what you've seen tonight. Based on what you've seen. So not now, but on the way out, if you'd like to indicate uh, which candidate you're going to most, most want to follow, that's going to give us a little bit of leverage so that um, when you read the Northern Advocate in the next week, you'll be able to see how tonight felt for everyone else in the room. I was just going to say, Charmaine, if you don't have a pen, We've put on here that you can tear the face of the... Sounds rather awful. <laughs> so if anyone has angered you tonight, unfortunately, and you've torn it, you've voted for them, so you may have to get a new form. So what have we got f wrapping up, Charmaine? Just two minutes closing. So we're going to invite each of our candidates up on stage. Two minutes to close and round up the evening. Um, we'll time cap you again so that you feel comfortable. Well, start from <laughs> Should we start from the other end? Tony, Why not? come on up. Now, candidates, if you're not mentioning this in your closing, feel free just to very quickly tell the audience where you understand your party to be polling right now. Well, I've just been text the polls, and it's 43 to Labour and 39 to the other outfit. <laughs> Look, I'm, stand I'm standing here today... <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm standing here today because Whangarei needs an MP that's in government. And, and those just, that poll just tells you who's going to be in government, I hope. Our friends in the government argue the economy is doing well, but the truth is the gap between the rich is just getting more and more entrenched, especially in Whangarei. A truly successful economy is one that serves its people, not the other way around. And that means we must judge success differently. Success is about the well-being of people working to keep our economy going. And it's time we shared some honesty about economic success not being evenly spread. Not only between people, but in our regions here. We have to rebalance the economy so the regions can start participating and taking advantage of success. How you actually feel about wages, your cost of living and your prospects matters more to me than numbers. If people feel like they're going backwards, how can we claim that we're going forwards? Economic success has to feel real. So after all of this discussion today, what are we going to do? Now what? We stand in the footsteps of leaders who set the agenda for this country, for Savage creating a welfare state, for Fraser free education, for Kirk full employment, for Longy standing up to nukes, for Clark social infrastructure. So what then is our purpose? Our purpose is to build a country where every child grows up free from poverty and is filled with hope and opportunity. I started this by saying this election should be about hope, but it's turned into a conversation about trust. So in these last couple of weeks, let's bring that conversation back to hope hope for a better, fairer future, a future we can be proud of. And with the Labour, that's exactly what we will do. Shane. Let's do this. Shane, your understanding of where National is currently at the polls? Uh, I know what our internal polling is showing, but I, I actually need to keep that to myself, so I'm hearing for the first time what this poll tonight is. Sure. So I'll, I'll have a further discussion later tonight. And your lisp, your lisp, come on, let's give him a fair go. Your, your lisp position? 45. Thank you. So that's, what percentage would your party need for you to go in as a list MP? Uh, about uh, 40%. Sure. Mm. Okay. Mm. Mm. 40%. Thank you.
Good. Whangarei is part of a strong economy with job growth because a strong and stable government has returned the books to surplus for the first time in many years. In 2008, we inherited interest rates at 11%, burgeoning national debt and rundown state houses and schools. Under the guidance of Bill English, we all turned that around. We tightened our belts and traded our way out of the GFC, and Whangarei is part of that story. Local land-based industries traded their way out, and now 50% of exports are covered under free trade agreements. We've opened our skies to Philippine Airlines, Singapore Airlines, Qatar, and Emirates. These airlines bring tourists to Whangarei, and tourism is now the biggest contributor to the Northland economy, applying thousands of jobs. With a stable government and a strong economy, we have low inflation and low interest rates. This allows Whangarei businesses to invest and employ people, and for young people to have low interest rates for home mortgages. A stable government generating surpluses means that we can raise the minimum wage every single year, maintain wage growth at the fourth fastest in the OECD, increase benefits for the first time in 40 years, and roll out the family incomes package, which will put $1,000 a year in hard-working New Zealanders' pockets and lift a third of families out of poverty. In a stable United Government and the experience, it is the stable United Government and the experience of Bill English that has got us to this position. Our Prime Minister should be someone who has had their leadership tested under severe world conditions and brought us through. Our Prime Minister should be someone who has had their leadership tested under severe natural disasters such as Christchurch and Kaikoura earthquakes and brought us through. In summary, there is value in people with a track record. And so I'm asking for your support as the MP for Whangarei on September 23rd and for Bill English as PM with Party Vote National. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again, Murray. Hi. So tell us, what's your understanding of what would need to happen for you to become an MP or to end up in Parliament? Well, I suppose um, for me to end up being an MP in Parliament, I have the privilege of being a leader and everything else. Um, I can do whatever I want, I can choose whatever I want to change, whether it's for education, employment, infrastructure and growth and housing. So I do really have the privilege in, in doing my own policies, which I have done, but um, I think that's probably why if you vote for me, we can sit down in a forum get together and I can say, well, what do you really want for the next generation? What do you want for them in the next five, three to five or ten years? I would like to ask you, do you care about what's happening with your next generation, with your grandchildren, your children's children? Do you want them to have a better life, a better future and a, fut in a, in a better lifestyle in Whangarei? I think if we can take our if we can give better education, affordable housing, and all the things that all our candidates have been saying, I think that'll be what our next generation will be looking forward to. And I'll tell you something, um, I'm pretty lucky too because I can actually, I can actually be a coalition with any of the, anyone that gets into government. So, you know, I don't have to worry about that. I can just, because I'll tell you something, they all fit fit uh, my policies. Not all, not all of them got policies that I want to have, but at least I can drive with them and I can ride with them and walk alongside them. And that's what I would do if, if you voted for me, I will take Whangarei to wherever they want to go and accomplish anything they want to do because of um, standing as an independent for the next generation I think we can do anything and having the people behind me and standing together as one because the people take the people vote you and the people can take you right out. So if you give me this chance to become an MP in Parliament, I do have the power, I do have influences and in businesses and I know I can be a strong um, person to voice for you as well as your children and your children and your children. And after I finish here, well, after the elections, I will be setting up my party anyway. I just didn't have time. So all the putia that I've put into getting myself here has been on my own 
you know, on a, or, on a rag of oily, you know, um, smell of an oily rag. And I think that came from Act quite a few years ago. But anyway, um, for me to get here now, Time. can you imagine how I can take you there when the elections come up in the future? So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thanks, Murray. So, uh, Chris, as Deputy Leader, we will assume you're number two on your party list, is that correct? Uh, yes, I am. Yep. Tell us a little bit about... Well, I first uh, moved to Whangarei in uh, the early 1970s and set up a business here. Uh, and so my focus is very much on what's good for Whangarei. Uh, what's good for Whangarei tends to be good for the rest of the country as well. But, but there's a, a unique opportunity here for you to end up with three MPs in Parliament and all the advantages that would be uh, conferred on us by having three MPs working away in Parliament to, get to do good things for Whangarei. Now, Shane Reddy is going to get back in on his party list. The figure, Shane, by the way, is 36%. So the National Party vote go below 36% for you not to be elected on the party list. Um, so you can guarantee that Shane will be back in. Uh, and the polls are going to show that they're going to get about 12. So you've already got two MPs, so you don't need to use your candidate vote for either of them, because your party vote is going to get them into Parliament. So you could use your candidate vote to get an MP number three. And, well, you could use it for Tony, but if you look at the polls for Whangarei, you'll find that um, the, the Labour candidate vote is way, way down below what it would need to be in order to get Tony into Parliament. But you could, have, you could take a chance with some more innovative ideas. You could take a chance with some of the things that I've been talking about that are very different from what you've heard from the other candidates. And because I'm an independent, I'm not stuck with a party line. So I could work across party lines and use innovative ideas to try and generate the best for Whangarei. So my suggestion to you is that you think about the strategic power of your candidate vote and use it to get a third MP. Thank you, Chris. Uh, to the organisers, thank you very much, Mr Cooper, for uh, my uh, Arawa Fanonga, Charmaine. Thank you very much for uh, guiding us this evening. You're a thousand percent better than the fools I had to tolerate in Auckland last night. Those of you Whangarei voters, thanks for turning out. We've had a large number of these sessions. We've endeavoured to conduct them with civility, respect for the sitting member, but candour to him that um, we want his job. A number of you will need to ask yourselves who really has a plan and who's likely to have enough leverage and enough power and influence to force either of the two parties to stop ignoring this part of the North. I'm putting myself forward to be that person. It is Winston and I who are adamant the rail spur will go to Marsden Point if we providentially are gifted the opportunity to create a government. The Marsden Point expansion a la the relocation of much of the business of the ports of Auckland, including part of the Navy, will comprise the essential discussions that we have in the event we are able to help form a government. Vote for someone who not only is a power broker with inordinate experience such as my good self through business, politics and international, but vote for a force for Whangarei, vote for someone who actually not only has a plan, but between my leader and I will be right at the centre as to how capital is allocated and influence is recalibrated to put the regions before our friends from Auckland on every single blimmin' issue. Thank you very much. And that's my thing. 
who will still lead the conversation on renters' rights, on housing, on poverty, on climate change, on cleaning up the rivers, on stopping water bottling plants, and on manufacturing. These are all policies that we've put up first this year, and other parties have copied and watered down passionately. It's true. Yeah? So we're not voting on the change of government. We're voting on what type of government we want the new government to be. When we've got a system, then our Prime Minister can stand up and say that 60% of all rents in this country are subsidised by the government. We do not have a market system. We have a market that's failing. The Greens have always been opposed to that across successive governments for decades. When we have the two other major parties talking about lifting 100,000 people or 100,000 people out of poverty. We know they're aiming low. The Greens policy, announced six weeks ago, immediately lifts 212,000 people out of poverty in one year because it undoes the 20% drop in welfare that happened in 1992. I was five at the time and I have a better memory of that than some other people were up here on the stage with me. We're just bringing it back to normal because we believe that that's the start. We've been talking in scarcity models all night about fighting to Wellington for getting enough stuff for us, as if there isn't enough stuff to go around. When did it become a normal narrative for the people of New Zealand or the people of the world to think that there wasn't enough stuff to go around? When did that happen? There's always been enough stuff to go around. Time. It's just at the moment, some people have too much of it, and we are those people. And the Green Party will always be fighting for those people with you. Thank you very much for coming along tonight. Mm. Thank you for voting tonight in the straw poll. Most of all, thank you for informing yourself so that you can vote uh, between next Monday, I believe, and September the 23rd. And uh, thank you to everybody who made tonight happen, not least of all our candidates. Mm. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.